Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Holm. I'm here to talk to you about a project that's been near and dear to my heart for the past six, seven years. It's been set up by a computer emergency response team in Ireland. Now, I know I've got the joys of being the last talk before lunch, so uh, hopefully I won't keep you too late for lunch uh, or whatever. But this whole journey began back in 2004. In 2004, I finally set up my own independent consulting business and it gave me an opportunity to look at well, what is missing in the Irish information security community, what do we need in the community to make our, our systems and society more secure. And I've been looking around thinking there is a problem that we have, we don't have a computer emergency response team. So I went about seeing well, how, how do we set one up, I've never set one up before, particularly at a national level I felt. This is something of a challenge, not, not, not easy to do. And you can see, this is a map from, is anybody familiar with ANISA, the European Network Information Security Agency? The website anisa.eu is actually very, very good. They're an independent body uh, funded by the EU doing a lot of research into information security. Uh, they have a team dedicated to computer emergency response, and they do a lot of research in there. And this is a map they had back in 2005 of all computer emergency response teams within the EU. As you can see, here's the little dear old Ireland. And we've got one search here called HEA Net Search, but that actually is part of Janet Search, which is part of the UK. And it only focuses on third level education. So in, in Ireland, all universities share one big network. And uh, HEA Net is the search for, for, for that network. So in Ireland, we had no computer emergency response team. And I thought that was strange because way back in 2004 and previous to that, we were set in Ireland as being the Silicon Valley of Europe. We had a lot of foreign direct investment with a lot of major uh, IT companies coming to Ireland. We had Dell, we had, part of the, we had the European headquarters in Ireland, Microsoft, IBM, Symantec, McAfee, Trend, Apple, EMC, Cisco, I could go on, there's quite a large number of IT companies. And on top of that, there was a lot of major multinationals moving in for the financial sector. We also had our own indigenous organizations and companies. In Ireland, despite all that major investment and all those multinationals come into Ireland, the majority of businesses in Ireland are SMEs. 97% of all companies are on the SME sector. Now, in Ireland, the SME means any company that has less than 50 employees or less than 10 million euro turnover per year. So you can see it's, it's actually very, very small companies and there's quite a lot of them around there. All of them had, as every organisation does, increasing dependency on IT and information security. Most of them had no source of independent security advice. So if they had an incident, or they wanted to know about what the latest threats or issues were, they had nowhere they could go that they felt there would be no biased information coming to them. They had their own resources they could go and talk to, but of course the problem with that is those resources would probably end up trying to sell them a product as opposed to giving them any proper or independent advice. I also felt, you know, as an you know, this may sound silly, but I'm actually very patriotic, and I felt this was a part of my patriotic duty to do, that we needed this, same way as in society we need a police force, a fire, fighter, fighting capabilities, and emergency services. From an, from an information technology society point of view, we needed computer emergency response team. I felt our economy was at risk. If we're setting ourselves at the Silicon Valley of Europe, how can we expect all these major multinationals to feel confident that their systems are going to be secure and be looked after by the Irish government and the Irish people if they locate in Ireland? Our own indigenous companies who are trying to create their own technologies and their own unique uh, solutions to, to business problems, all their intellectual property is potentially at risk. So how can we protect those people as well? Our national security and trade and network infrastructure was at risk. Now being a neutral country, we don't have the same threats our risk that a lot of other major organ company countries would have. So for example, not the US, we don't have the same profile that the US would have with the same risk, but we do have our own problems. We have an, an, uh, our own domestic terrorism issues, and we still do. 
So we had the real IRA, we, we had also free, we had the uh, unions terrorists as well. So they were there looking to, to create, create havoc. We're very closely tied with the UK. A lot of our telecommunication companies are UK tele telecommunication companies. A lot of the major uh, retailers in Ireland are also major retailers in the UK. So there's, there's a very close relationship at, a, at an IT and telecommunications level with the UK. And the UK often felt that Ireland could be a soft backdoor into their critical energy infrastructure. If you're going to attack the UK, maybe not hit us head on, but you know, hack into Ireland and then you can piggyback in on the, on the data communications and, and networks that are there. Our own law enforcement have no data. Back in 2004, for a country with a population of four and a half, five million people, we had a computer crime unit of four people. As we all know here today, saying something is computer crime is saying, it's like saying something is shoe crime. Anytime somebody tries to commit a crime, a computer is involved. Either in, the, either in the act of committing that crime, be that hacking or whatever, or in planning it. Yeah. So any time there was an instance, a major police instance, that, that computer crime had been plugged in. Nobody is going to them with any information to say, listen, this is the amount of attacks that are happening, these are the number of breaches that are happening, these are the impacts that are happening. They have no information, so for the Guard Computer Crime Unit to go and look for funding and more information and more resources would be quite difficult. As I said earlier on, we're a soft backdoor into the UK. So I figured we're not in a fair fight here, guys. The attackers are more complex. We all know that. They're, getting, they're using greater sophisticated tools. Our defences aren't as sophisticated anymore. We're still relying on antivirus and firewalls. You know, we haven't improved much. I firmly believe our biggest, uh, one of our, one of our big, biggest weapons, of defensive weapons, is, is information. <laughs> sharing information and being aware of what's going on so that we can react quicker and, and smarter. But without a certain anything like that, Ireland is it, was in, a, 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 in an unfair fight. And like, there was a lot of computer crime and computer incidents going on. Uh, in 2006, the University College of Dublin, they have a cyber crime uh, uh, research unit. They have a, an area that does a whole lot of uh, research and investigation into cyber crime and what's happening from the industry point of view. And that cybercrime unit, in partnership with the, with the ISSA chapter, the Irish ISSA chapter, conducted a, uh, a survey on uh, computer security issues in Ireland. And they found of all the companies that were surveyed, 97% of them had a computer security incident. 20% had suffered losses greater than 100,000 euro. Unfortunately, 66% of thereabouts had suffered a computer virus. No, but <laughs> We still figured this day and age this shouldn't be happening. But it did indicate there was a lot of issues going on. So I felt it's time to engage with the community and the stakeholders and figure out what is going on and what do we need to do to combat this. So my first port of call was to the Irish Department of Communications. That's the department responsible in Ireland for internet security. We don't have a cyber security czar, we don't have a, a, any central area of that, but the Department of Communications is, is, is the first point of call. But luckily enough, being Ireland, in a lot of cases, it's not what you know, it can be often be who you know. So I was trying to get, figure out who should I meet in the Department of Communications to figure this out. I discovered that the Secretary General, so the top guy next to the Minister of the Department of Communications, I knew him from five years ago. So luckily, a phone call was made and I was in talking to their people uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so I sat down with them and said, OK, guys, listen, this is what I believe. I believe we need a cert. These are the problems I believe we have. Why haven't we got a cert? And the answer was, well, no, but we asked for one. <coughs> and I was going, yeah, but like, did you wait until people were raped or murdered before we decided to have a police force? Did we wait until buildings burnt down before we decided to have a, a, a fire service? Uh, and they're holding on, hard, yeah, but you know, we don't want to spend a whole lot of money and put something in place and nobody's going to use it because you know, we have a fairly okay system where we have this loose industry body where if there's any major security incident, we get everybody sitting on a table and we just discuss it and then we try and figure it out. And I was going, well, that's not very proactive or 
you know, isn't very scalable or indeed very repeatable. It may, may, may not be the best way to do things. So it's okay, Brian, you go away and you come back to us and you prove to us that a cert is a good idea. Now, but you're not getting paid. You're not an official representative of the Department of Communications. This is your project, all hands off, away you go. So in a way, they had a, a very much a win-win situation. If I came back and said, this is a great idea, we need to set the cert, the government could go, well, aren't we really clever? We, we engage with this and consult and then we got it set up and running. If it didn't work out, they could say, well, yeah, you know, what do we know? You know, we have this guy to look into it and it didn't work out and it didn't cost anything. But anyway, as I said, I was a patriotic guy, so I said I'd go ahead and do it. So I met with various different people. I met with the police, the uh, Department of Defence. I met with uh, various industry representative bodies. So uh, IPEC is a big representative body for all major corporations in Ireland. I met the Small Firms Association, uh, Irish Small and Medium Size uh, Enterprise Association, Chambers of Ireland, uh, ISSA, ISACA, uh, OWASP, met all their user groups, went out and interviewed people individually to get feedback from them and say, is this a good idea? And overwhelmingly, the, the answer was a positive yes. I also ran a survey, so I'm not just trying to, you know, have a very small sample of information coming back. We ran a survey where we sent a survey out to all IT representative bodies and got people to, to give us information back. So overwhelmingly, as you can see there, 80, nearly 83% of the respondents says, yes, we do need a cert. So I said, well, great, we have a whole lot of uh, information here. We have a positive feedback, and this is what we want to do. So I went ahead and I wrote a business plan, figured out exactly what we needed from the cert, so what services the community wanted, what office hours they wanted, you know, when they wanted the service to use, uh, to, be, to be, op be operating, uh, how much money that would cost, how much staff we would need. I talked to UCD, if you remember earlier on, I said the Centre for Cybercrime had been conducting these surveys on security instances. They were willing to host a survey, uh, sorry, host the cert, so physically providers with offices and bandwidths and even postgraduate students to help us do various different things. And I brought that to the, book, to the Department of Communications and I said, there you go guys, here's a business plan, here's the exact cost you need, this is exactly what you need to do, job done. At least I thought so. But how many people here work in government or have worked with government? They're not the most rapidly moving organisations, are they? <laughs> They actually could be very quite frustrating. And over a period of time, I kept emailing, I kept phone calls, figuring out what's going on, how, how is this thing progressing, what's the next steps. And it was, you know, to say the pace was glacial would be putting glaciers down as, you know, Formula One racing cars. It was very, very slow and very, very frustrating. So I was getting very completely pissed off, if you pardon the expression because throughout my research I'd also been engaged with the CERT community in Europe. So I've, out of my own pocket I've been attending ANISA conferences on, for, for CERTs. I've been going to TFC CERT which is a user group of CERTs in Europe uh, to their meetings to get engaged with that community and to get advice from people who've done it before. And because I had been there and they're going, you're the guy who's setting up the CERT in Ireland, we're going to phone you every time you have a problem now. So, while these guys were sitting having coffee breaks and biscuits and figuring out what was going to happen, I was getting phone calls saying, we're being attacked by IP addresses in this address range, Brian, can you help us shut it down or can we respond to it? And I'm going, well, all I can do is make a phone call, I'm just one guy. So it got very, very frustrating. Until Estonia, 2007, the DDoS attack on Estonia. All the IT teams were like, ooh, that's really a bad action. Give yeah. <laughs> me. Because what happened then, the phone calls started coming to me and the emails started coming to me. Brian, we need to come in, you need to come in and talk to us about this. This is serious stuff. Could this happen to Ireland? Could Ireland face the same problems? Could we be cut out from the internet? And could we be targeted and attacked in the same way? So things started to take up a bit more pace. Things looked promising. And then we had a general election. And we got a new minister of the Department of Communications who was from the Green Party. 
So his agenda changed the whole thing completely because now it was more on the green issues and green IT, etc. And then we also started to see the credit crunch start to happen there again, you know. So again, you know, after the Estonia, I thought the job was done, but with all these issues, things were slowing down and they weren't moving the way they should, should have been moving. And then in 2008, I got a phone call from a, a, a contact I'd made in, in a Scandinavian search. He says, Brian, we're actually, one of our financial institutions here is having a DDoS attack that was bigger than Hawaii, Estonia. There's a lot of Irish IP addresses involved in the attack and we need them shut down. Can you help? I mean, hey, I'm just one guy. I do what I can do. So I did what I could do, which was basically very different because I was bringing up the, the abuse contacts in the different telecoms and they're going, well, yeah, you know, you're not a search, you're not nobody, if you're not a customer, go away. Uh, so that attack finished and my contact came back to me and says, listen, thanks for your help, Brian. I know you tried to do your best. But you need to realize that despite all the work you've been doing, Ireland is now recognized as being worse to respond to cybercrime than China. Now, with all due respect to any Chinese people in the audience or are listening in, I was not very happy with that because, you know, let's say China doesn't have a great reputation in the area of cybercrime. So, Iris is born. The Irish Reporting and Information Security Service. A nice catchy name. <laughs> So I set that up in 2008. So we're the first C search in Ireland, our computer emergency response team, that the, the phrases are interchangeable. We provide our service on information security. Oops, sorry, I jumped back. All our services are provided for free of charge. Because the whole base of the model I was making was that if you're going, we all work in information security. We all know how difficult it is to convince somebody to do something you know, from information security. People don't want to spend money on security. So if I was going to provide this service as a charge, uh, with a charge, people weren't going to use it. <coughs> They'd be discouraged from using it. So instead of a not-for-profit organization, because Ireland is a very litigious society, and the last thing I wanted was to face a lawsuit and uh, uh, lose my house over somebody reacting to some advice they got from the CERT and doing screwing things up. So they can sue the not-for-profit organization and take all our profits, which is zero. <coughs> so we provide these services. Auto services are Irish focused, which is very important because I know people around here probably subscribe to various different alerting uh, services anyway, like Boat Track or Security Focus or, or Secuni or whatever, or, or Qualys. Uh, Sorry, my laptop has got a mind of its own there. Uh, but we all know how much information that comes in and that, and it floods your inbox, and it's not very, you know, yeah, you're an SME in Ireland, you've got a 50 user network, you're predominantly Windows, but yet you're signed up to Secunia or something like that, and you're getting alerts about Linux, Apple, you know, some PC game or something like that. They're not very clear to what you are, so you end up ignoring them. Using our service, you can have focus alerts to what you want and what you want to be alerted on. Instant awareness, so we're uh, making people aware of what's going on. So we can communicate back to the community and say, these are the type of attacks that we have seen, therefore, this is what you should be doing to make sure you don't become victims of it either. If there's any major attacks going on, we can give a sanitized attack notification. So we can take information in from a, a, a member of the uh, of virus anonymize information and send it out to maybe the same industry sector, so if it's an accountancy firm or a sister's firm that's been attacked, we can send it. This is the type of attack we're seeing against your industry. This is what you should need to do to, 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 to figure it out. We also provide a coordination service. So now, when a certain rings, they're not ringing me, they're ringing a certain Ireland, and then when we contact a telecommunications company, it's not an individual contact with them, it is a search, which actually does have some, 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 some weight. We're also looking to do some Irish focused research, look at trends and metrics. What are the type of attacks that are happening in Ireland? What, what, what's going on so that people can create better awareness and people can be better prepared to, 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 to uh, fix them and, and defend against them? We're also looking at how we share knowledge. Right? Now, we're not looking to put the consulting business and, and companies out of business in Ireland. We're looking to 
create more awareness, therefore people realise they need to do something and therefore they can better protect their services, either by themselves, doing some more research, or by engaging with a consulting firm or a researcher. So we're not looking to replace them, we're just trying to increase awareness and make people more aware of what's going on. Currently these are all our constituency, so we serve government departments. So we have Department of Communications, we have the Department of Finance, Department of Defence, they've all signed up as customers. And I'll say customers because they're not paying, but they're still calling them customers. We have private sector companies, all the major banks, all the ma major utility companies are set up as well. Predominantly most of our members are in the SME sector, so from 10 person companies up, up and up. We have industry bodies who are, who are signed up to represent. And we also have other certs who, who are contacting us now, so we actually have quite a good relationship with quite a number of certs throughout Europe and around the world. Since 2008, we, are, we have achieved the following. We are now accredited by the uh, TFC cert. TFC cert runs a trusted introducer program, which is basically how, you know, in the cert community, you just can't go and set up a cert. And I'm going to kick this laptop off the desk in a minute. Maybe it's infected with the virus, can't kind of the <laughs> So, TFC CERT, they have a thing called the Trust Introducer Framework. The CERT community is rather tight, and any, any of you who work in the CERT community will probably appreciate that, and the reasons behind it are quite obvious. You just don't want anybody showing up and meeting and going, hey, I'm an instant response, give me all the information you have, because you never know who that person is, or what, the, what their motives are, or, or what they're going to do with the information. Uh, is shared amongst the CERT community uh, as well. So there is a trusted issues of framework whereby you have to be known by another CERT who will sponsor you, and then you have to go through a process whereby all your process procedures and everything else are verified that you know you are doing things in the proper way, you are doing things according to recognized industry standards that you are gonna, you know, play play nice with everybody else in the sand pit and you're gonna share your information. So we are now credit to this, which means we are part of the European CERT community. Jason? How, how hard is that process? I mean, also how long? It, you can apply, they only take two certs a year. Okay. So we, you, you apply and you, you put in a, an application status and then they contact all the other certs and say, is it okay, you want this cert to come in? And they, they say yes. You go to the next phase and say no, well then it's over and done with. Uh, we had one, uh, one question, not an objection at that space, which was, uh, we're not a full-time body. Ours is all volunteers. We have a bunch of 15 guys, uh, information security professionals in Ireland, who give up our own free time. So today, there are two guys rotated to be instant handers today. So they're checking the system and respond to issues during the coffee break, during the lunch break, or whenever we get a few, few minutes. So we're not dedicated. And that was a big question. How can they provide a search if they're not full time? And that, that was a problem. The next stage is uh, you then have to get two certs to sort of support your application. So you have to have a relationship with these certs already. So you just can't turn up and say, you know, can we go to the introduce process? So they, they will support. And then you fill out a lot of paperwork saying this is how we do things, this is the systems we use. This is our process for doing this, that, and the other. TFC sort of reserved the right to come on site to audit you to make sure that you are doing those stuff. Lucky enough, we didn't have to do that because we very, you know, we'd have to bring them somewhere and sort of say, you know, we're virtual. You know, maybe the Pope and just sort of say, this is where we run things from. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, so it took about six to nine months, I'd say, to, you know, from them saying, yeah, go ahead and. And, and doing it because you need to exchange your PGP keys and, and, and who your main contacts are and emergency contacts and all that and that all has to be done and that's all uh, vetted and, and verified before they before do it. But, uh, you said there's two applications accepted each year. How many applications are submitted each year? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> 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 But we've also been authorised by CERT CC to use the phrase that we are a CERT. Uh, ANISA recognises that as being a CERT for Ireland. 
which I think has upset the Irish government because they're supposed to be doing this stuff anyway. Like under EU agreements and uh, directives, all, by the end of 2010, all countries in the EU are supposed to have a national cert. Ireland doesn't have one yet. We're not a national cert. To be a national cert, you have to have the government mandate to sort of say, we are now acting on behalf of Ireland and the cert community. So you're like a gorilla cert. We are like a gorilla cert, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. yeah. That, that's quite unusual for the Irish to be, uh, you know, doing oh, things yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But Anissa, you know, I think it is ironic that Anissa are now recognising us as the cert for Ireland. You know, they actually, they, they have been great and provide a whole lot of great support for to me personally and, and the project. And if you do, or if any of you are looking to set up an incident response team, go to their site. They have a uh, whole areas dedicated to certs. They have uh, not, I mean, very, very good information that you can use in setting your project up. But also a warp. Anybody familiar with what a warp is? <laughs> warp, and I'll go into more detail later on, but it's a warning, advice and reporting point which was developed by the UK uh, government to promote security awareness amongst the UK community. Because the UK has four or five certs and there are all these big, very official bodies and nobody wants to talk to them. But a warp is more community based and actually provides a lot of cool tools which could be used by yourself if you're looking to set up an incident response team or a search function within your organisation. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. I say we're a not-for-profit organisation, but we still have to spend money to go, Jason, come back to the question you asked there about the uh, uh, accreditation process. You actually you have, you have to pay for it as well. You have to pay an application fee and then an annual fee. We also have to pay for our hosting of our systems and, you know, in Ireland, a not-for-profit company, you have to get your accounts audited, no matter how many transactions you have. So we have one, two, three, five transactions. We have to pay 1,500 euro for an accountant to count five transactions and go, yes, we have audited these accounts and this is what's going on. But SANS is our primary sponsor. Without SANS, there would be no, there would be no cert in Ireland. From the very beginning, SANS have provided a lot of support, both you know, uh, knowledge-wise and everything else, but also financially. Uh, we're now sponsored by IEDR, which is Ireland's domain, it's the Irish Domain Registry, which I think is a great coup for us to be, be sponsored by them. Net Witness have sponsored us, Singles have sponsored us now as well, and of course my own company in the middle there has provided sponsorship as well to get it up and running. So without those sponsors, there would be no cert in Ireland. Reaction overall has been very, very positive. The community has said, this is great, fantastic, about time we got it in place. Uh, the press has been very good. They thought it's been, it had been very responsive to it and supportive. Uh, most government departments have been very supportive. Department of Communications hasn't said anything, good, bad, or indifferent, which probably means it's bad because <laughs> they don't like talking this. The hosting providers and telecommunication companies in Ireland, most of them have been quite good. Though again, anybody get, again involved in incident response and trying to coordinate incidents will probably recognise that. Some are better than others. Some telcos we send information into, we'll hear nothing back and nothing will happen. Other telcos will respond immediately and, and be quite responsive. And one threatened me with a legal letter. We actually got uh, contacted by uh, the French search. Uh, I won't say to say that they come across 15 compromised SSH accounts uh, belonging to Irish telcos, all of them with user and passwords that they found in a bigger investigation. They gave me the information. I contacted one particular uh, telco, I had to go to the support desk, and said, I want to support, re report a security incident. What's your customer number? I'm not a customer. Then you can't report a security incident. <laughs> but I'm trying to help you. You've got a problem. I mean, you know, one of your SSH accounts is, which turned out was used to manage their routers, or routers, Thank you. <laughs> uh, had, had been compromised. You're, you're not a customer, you can't report it. Can you get someone to ring me back? The next call is from their legal department. <laughs> you know, you use that information anyway, we're going to sue you. I said, I don't want to use the information, I want to give you the information. Well, we don't want it. Okay, your problem. <laughs> so, reaction has been varied, but in the main, it's been very, very positive. The CERT community 
has been very happy because now they have a central point in Ireland that they can refer issues to and they know that they get responded to in some way, shape or form. Obviously that depends how responsive the downstream people are to us, the telecoms, etc. But uh, in, in the main, that, that is improving. So Brian, do you now have relationships established with Some of them we have to go to the support desk. Some of them I can ring the CEO directly. Uh, one of the major ones I have the their operations managers, small by number to be at any stage. Uh, because interestingly enough, they are one of the worst responsive ones until we got I got a phone call from uh, a researcher who said he discovered a bug on their website for you know you can fill in a form to apply for broadband or for more information. And he said that was being used as a relay to send spam out. And if he, if I didn't get that telco to shut that page down, he was going to go to the press and he was going to uh, publicise the whole lot about how crap this telco security was. So I uh, managed to hold him at bay for about four or five days while I went through communicating with the telco and going through the guy and eventually talking to the operations manager. So I think he appreciated. The effort we put in to keep their name out of the way. This is all on our own time, yeah. All of this is all on our own time. We're not getting paid for this. It's all voluntary stuff. So, what's the biggest barrier to getting those communication channels open? Like, are, some of them just don't care enough to. I think some of them don't care enough. I think, I think part of it, we don't have a big enough stick to, to, to wield. So, you know. Ireland doesn't have a cyber security strategy. We were meant to have one developed in, in, before our minister last November. We're still waiting for it to be developed and brought out. Uh, so, you know, the whole approach to, to, to security is a very piecemeal one, and we still haven't got to where we need. And I think, yes, the telcos, a lot of them in the host borders are taken serious, a lot of them aren't. Well, not that they aren't taken serious, they're probably, you know, they got the government to do. What we need to do as well is make them more aware of who we are and what we're trying to do. And that's part of the future plans is that, we, you know, depending on how much funding we get, we're going to try and improve the services we provide out to the community. We're hopefully to 2011, we'll, we'll, we'll become members of FIRST, of first. so we're going to start applying for FIRST for membership and, 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 and become a member of FIRST at some stage, hopefully. Um, provide more, uh, Jason. Uh, do you have a plan where you start trying to transition to like maybe a uh, for-profit organization where you start hiring people and hiring employees? I don't think it could ever be a for-profit organization because that way then you can sort of undermine the credibility of what you're trying to do. If you're if you're if you're trying to provide service to the community. Well, maybe, maybe not for-profit, but you actually. Yeah. So you start making money, you actually start hiring. People. If we could get a government grant, or we could get enough funding, or one. Of the, Models we're looking at is maybe set up a subscription service for the members, so that depending on how big an organisation you are, you pay a membership fee. So if you're over a thousand users, you pay a thousand euro. If you're less than a thousand users, you pay five hundred euro. If you're less than, you know, so different sizes. Or if you're fifty or less, you, you do it for free. If you're a charge, you, you, your membership is free. But we have to try and <coughs> make people more aware of what we do, show that we provide value before you can start charging for it. So yes, our long-term plan would be to become a full-time service, but that's all going to be dependent on the funding we get. Uh, but you wouldn't have to change your corporate structure today, so you no. don't have a profit. Exactly. We're still not for profit, we still get money in. Uh, did, did you run into any pushbacks from existing organizations within Ireland, like government, military, <coughs> not, not really, no. Uh, it's an interesting question because, in one way, as the Department of Communication has been very, you know, supportive of us. But there have been instances that we've been involved in that we that we can't talk about, and because of that, we are a certain part of our community. We've had those instances much better. We've, we've dealt with targeted attacks against certain Irish organisations, where we've been alerted by other certs and we've passed the information on, which is which were part of. Uh, you know, the C and I and stuff like that. So it's, uh, 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 it's been a mixed reaction. But any pushback? No, the only one was that solicitor ring me up saying, uh, you know, 
You want to report this instrument to Syria? And I said, okay, <laughs> you're a problem. So hopefully, you know, what I learned through this, I'd like to share with everybody here, and hopefully you can, uh, now it's gone off again, okay. Don't buy it down. <laughs> so, best thing to do is to do plenty of planning. Okay, so I get it then. If you want to do something, make sure you do your plenty of planning. Engage with your stakeholders, though. Identify who are you providing your services to. You know, we're ourselves up at a, at a national level, so we're looking at the business community within, our, within Ireland, predominantly the SME sector. But if you're looking at it for your own internal use, is it certain parts of the organisation you're doing it? Is it all of the organisation? Is it your IT? Or is it your production line? Or, or whatever. Who are your stake stakeholders? Who is going to be your champion? One thing that I found very difficult was because I was doing it by myself, I was relying on people's goodwill towards me as an individual and, and, and my reputation within the industry. But if you're trying to set a cert up, you may need senior management backup or you, you, you know, commitment from, from somebody high up to, to, to be able to push you through and, and open doors for you to, 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 to get into places. So engage with the stakeholders. Find out what they want and what they need from the service. When I started on my journey, I figured these are the services that a cert in Ireland should provide. And I was pretty confident that that's what we needed. But after talking to people and doing the survey, I realised that was not what was required. Like, for example, I thought 24 hour, seven day a week service was with people. No, nine to five businesses were fine, we're happy with that. Maybe with an emergency contract if we needed. So it's figuring out what exactly people want. Then you can, you know, what, what, what to provide. Identify who your clients want to be. They probably end up looking like this guy down the phone, there's an issue going on, but try and get to them before they're looking like this. You know? Who are your clients going to be? What do they want? Uh, how do they want you to communicate with them? What information do they need? What are the services you're going to give? Are you going to provide instant response services? Are you going to you know, have a team with forensic tools and instant response services that you can jump into a car or, or on a plane or whatever and be on site and fix a problem for, the, for, for your, 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 your customer, be that internal or, or whatever? Or are you just you going to be a coordination service? Are you going to do, be doing fundability research? Are you going to be handling malware? Are you going to be providing any other services, consulting, training, or anything else like that? Figure out what you're trying to provide. And I suppose, back at the slides earlier on, figure out what your clients want, to, want you to provide. Establish exactly what your requirements are, so what do you need to cover what you're going to provide? Right? How much funding are you going to have to have? How much senior management? What staff? What type of skills are they going to have to have in place? What are they going to need to do? Do you need technical staff? Etc. So it's figuring out what, what exactly do they need? Do you need to provide the service to the business? What tools do you need? Anybody involved in that? I know Alex is, but anybody else involved in instant response or help them? So you're all very familiar with the wide variety of tools that are out there. So what tools do you need? Again, come back to the service you can provide. Well, obviously that, that, that's going to dictate what, what, what you're going to do. But uh, are you going to use commercial tools? Are you going to, be, you're going to use open source, etc.? So tr try and fig figure all that out. Anisa actually has a clearinghouse of tools, which is quite good. On the website, again, it gives you a list of all the tools that are available, both open source and commercial, so what you can use for, for your, your C-cert. This is most important. Without money and without support, you're not going to get anywhere. Be that internally or anywhere else, make sure you have the money to, to, to back you up. And then practice, practice, practice. Make sure you've got plenty of training in place. Make sure your staff and your handlers are all aware of what they're supposed to do how they're supposed to react to certain issues, what they're supposed to say, how they're supposed to communicate, make sure that they're all trained well in, in what they can or cannot say. The technical skills are quite important, but the soft skills are actually probably just as just important. If somebody's going to email in or phone or contact you in some way, shape or form, and they're in a, a high state of anxiety because they've just been compromised, you need to be able to talk that person down. You need to be able to get the information you require to respond to appropriately. So the soft skills of being able to empathise and, 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 and react properly 
are just as important as the technical skills. And then finally, when you've got all that together, establish your instant response team. And once you've established it, make sure people know where you are. Make sure people know you exist. Market your, your, your instant response team. No point setting yourself up and nobody using you. Going through all this pain and all this work and nobody using you the, at the end of the day. So make sure you mark yourself well, people know where you are. Make sure your, your contact details are ready, ready to be available on your website or anywhere else. And then deliver your service. Be prepared. You're going to have problems. You're going to do things wrong. So learn from your mistakes. Okay? Uh, but also promote the good things you do. Right? I think as we all tend to, because of the industry we're, we're in, we all tend to focus on the bad and the negative side of things. But we actually do do a lot of good work. And it's important that you promote that and you, your team are, is aware of that and your constituencies are aware of it as well. You will have problems. You will have hurdles to overcome. Some people won't be happy with what you're doing. So, you know, uh, funding is going to be an issue. There's going to be issues along the way getting into the community and being able to, to communicate with other certs. These are all hurdles along the way that you're going to have to try and figure out how to get over. But we'll live with patience and hopefully with some of the resources from ENISA and CERT CC and stuff, you can, you can get around them quite, quite easily. I talked about a warp and ours is a warp, so we're warning and advice reporting point. One of the big things for me was because we had very little funding, I didn't have a lot of money to go out and buy things. Or, or, or set things up. So the warp is developed by the UK CPMI. So you've got two parts, you've got the Philip Warning application part and you've got the MS, the multi-service platform. Now, don't all take a sharp intake of bread, but it's built on SharePoint and ASP. Okay. I know that's not. But here's the home screen. When you, as a member, when you sign into it, in, in, into, into Iris, into your wall. This is the home screen you get. You can see it's very much a SharePoint one. We have notice, notice board here. You can have uh, alerts come in there to an XML on the people's homepage. People get alerts from us by uh, email as well. You've got different areas here for uh, discussion groups, security, policy procedures, uh, tabs for good practice, it's reporting tools, etc. So there's a lot of information there for the members when, when they sign in. There's just more information there on the, on, the, on the home screen. In the good practice area, you've got <coughs> you split things up, you know, best practice for uh, good practice for applications, enterprise security networks, instant response, security awareness. And because this is all provided by the UK CPNI, it actually links back to the CPNI's website with a lot of their white papers as well. So it is interactive and it's updated quite regularly. We can add to it ourselves as well. Here's some of the instant reports, so people, members can tab in here and click in and sort of say these are the type of instances they've seen. So these are members reporting issues to us and they're quite happy to share it with, 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 with other members. Most of our instances you don't see in, in here because they report to us confidentially and we have a separate system to uh, a back end to this that we can report and, uh, and it's, just, it's just accessible to the operators. The fit of warning application, this is for the alerts are sent out. When members sign in, they can sign up, they, they can select operating systems or systems they're going to get uh, alerts on. So they've got, you know, if you want Apache or Mandrake or Microsoft or whatever else, they're all there. You just click on them and they're the only alerts you're going to get. You're not going to, if you haven't clicked on SUS or Red Hat, you're not going to get any of those alerts. Just what's it applicable to you. And because it comes into your mailbox from alerts at iris.ie, most people will sit up and take notice of it. We can create this is the way a warning will look when it comes into your mailbox or HTML or whatever. So it's color coded. Alex is green, yellow, and red. So red obviously for critical, uh, yellow for this is important, and green for this is just an advisory. So why pick a warp? Now, what, if you are setting up your instant response, why pick a warp? Well, the first thing is money. It's relative, it's, it's, it's a few hundred pounds to buy the whole system from the UK. Uh, Warp.gov.uk. You can buy it from there. Uh, you also, you know, you also have to provide your own hosting and service to, to put it up on, but it's only a few hundred, hundred pounds. Uh, you can set up fairly quickly from making the decision to set Iris up. We were operational within three months of making that decision, and that included 
getting the whole steam, getting the system set up, running a, uh, a period of test and getting the team together and, and, and a green training and stuff like that. You can tailor to your needs. So we've used the full blown there, but you can you know you can just provide the full one application, nothing else, or you can provide the, the home use. You can use it as a virtual. I, go, I like to say we're the first cert in the clouds because we don't have any place to live. We use the, we use the internet to, to do everything else, so we're the first cert in the clouds. So, you know, on our team, they use the system from home or work or whatever when, when it's spare time. And it's, it's community focused. The work model is based on community. So if you're a, you know, in the UK, they have walks for the legal community, they have a police walk just for the police forces, they have uh, regional walks, so for different areas in, 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 in the UK. There's a London Council walk, so for all the councils in, in London, they, they have a dedicated walk themselves. So they, you can share information based on the community. Uh, I argued that Ireland's SME sector, we're four and a half, population of four and a half million, you know, we're one third the size of London, so, you know, it's, we're, we're a small community compared to, to London. Uh, but it's very much community focused. If you do need more information, there's quite a lot of great information out there and it's all free. Anise is a step-by-step -step approach on the self to search. Search in a box from the Dutch uh, search, they've set up a, uh, a, a resource where you get everything in, in one go. Handbook for C search from Search CC. Uh, Form and response team for the Australian search. And actually they provide you a whole lot of great information. So two o'clock in the morning my time, I was talking to the guys in Australia about setting up all, all, all the search. And this has some good information. C search in the trainer.org, which is the TFC search uh, 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 website. And there's the trusted producers for C search. And then more information about the warp.gov.uk. And questions, just with one or two minutes to spare before lunch. Told you I wouldn't keep it for lunch. <laughs> Anybody have any questions, sir? Would you say that probably that the biggest challenge you face is? The communication problem or getting the name out there, telling or having people know to call you as opposed to just throw their hands up in the image system and hope the best. Yeah, well, it's taken time to build that up. So, how we're doing that is we actually host an annual conference. Our second one is November, November the 18th in Dublin, and it's free. You want to come along? We've got great loaded speakers there. We're also hosting Ireland's only cybersecurity challenge, Hack Era, for hackers, Hack Era. Uh, so we're using that to promote ourselves amongst the community uh, and that, that's helping. We're engaging that with the press, so they're providing us, you know, they're now, the press is now coming to us and then and it's a major incident in Ireland sort of saying what is the CERT's opinion on, on this type of attack or what would the CERT say. So we're kind of gradually getting out there. Uh, we are getting, you know, most of the incidents we respond to are from other CERTs that contact us because they've identified a phishing site host on an Irish website and could we shut it down. Uh, but we are getting Irish companies more and more now contacting us to sort of say, this is, this is a problem, how do, how do we go about this, how, do, how, how can you help us? Have you thought or have you approached any universities or colleges that have maybe even a little bit of security in the curriculum just to like maybe go in and speak for half hour? Oh yeah, well, if you remember earlier on I was talking about the, in UCD, the Centre for Cybercrime. We're actually partnering with them now, so we're hoping to be doing a lot more research and helping them do, you know, do, do joint research on cybersecurity trends in, in Ireland. We will, you know, we do try and engage with uh, different organisations and, and talk to them. We had, like last week, we had OWASP Barney was on, so one of our handlers gave a presentation of that. That's how we how we dealt with uh, a malware attack against a, a, an Irish website. Uh, we also have a Brew Con on, on Friday. Uh, he's also going to be given a, a day in the life of a volunteer surf handler uh, as well. So we are trying to get out there. Our problem is, I suppose, Andrew, is that we're a bunch of volunteers doing all our, in our own spare time. So there are limitations that we have to do. And I keep reiterating to the guys your jobs come first, your families come second. Oh, your families come first, your jobs come second. <laughs> Shows you where my head is, and uh, the cert comes uh, way down that, that priority list. Um, I wanted, uh, what time of um, volume of uh, reports and traffic are you doing 
And you see the problem to deal with that because I also in a response team mm -hmm. and one of the problems is managing two, three hundred emails a day, distributing it, sorting out the chat, working out what's important, prioritizing that, mm -hmm. especially when you have, I guess, with you, a, a virtual team as well. <coughs> We actually don't get a huge amount of email traffic at the moment, which is probably lucky, but so we have a high uh, volume, you know, and the email traffic we do get, most of it is stuff that we react to. So I would say on average we get between two and five instances a day that we have to react to. Most of them tend to be compromised Irish websites that are hosting malware or are hosting a phishing site that we are where we're coordinating to help shut down. Okay, well. Thank you for your attention, folks.